would see the promise, unquote. Well, no one is arguing that the Catholic Church needs to be refounded. In fact, we Serevacanas are the ones insisting that the Catholic Church cannot change, cannot suddenly proclaim a different religion, cannot defect. That is why we reject the Vatican II Church as a counterfeit of the real Catholic Church. It is the Vatican II Church that has redefined the nature of the Catholic Church with its elements ecclesiology, according to which the true Church of Jesus Christ exists fully in the Catholic Church, but also exists in elements in heretical sects, such that even Lutherans are part of the mystical body of Christ. They're simply in imperfect communion with the Catholics. In fact, in 1977, then Cardinal Carol Wojtyla, who would go on to become Pope John Paul II, wrote in his book Sign of Contradiction, quote, The Church succeeded during the Second Vatican Council in redefining her own nature, unquote. And that's on page 17 of the English edition of Sign of Contradiction published in 1979. So that's exactly what they did. They had to redefine the nature of the Catholic Church in order to make it compatible with ecumenism. As Bishop Donald Sanborn once pointed out, you can't do ecumenism with Protestants and Orthodox if you're claiming to be the one and only true Church of Christ to which all non-Catholics must convert. If you take that position, there can be no ecumenism. So they had to come up with some kind of redefinition of the Catholic Church that would reduce her claim to exclusivity in order to provide an opening for ecumenism. And that's what they did at Vatican II. And they admit it, too. We just heard Carol Wojtyla about this writing in 1977. Also, Joseph Ratzinger, the future Benedict XVI, wrote in 1969 that the ecclesiological teaching of Vatican II amounts to a reduction in the claim of exclusivity. And that's a quote, reduction in the claim of exclusivity. That's from his book, The New People of God, which may or may not be available in English but uh, in German, the German edition is Das Neue Volk Gottes, and that was published in 69, and you can find that on page 236. Now, that was back in 1969, but don't think that Ratzinger reversed himself on that later. He didn't. In fact, in 2001, Ratzinger wrote an article for the Vatican newspaper Osservatore Romano entitled The Ecclesiology of the Constitution on the Church. Now, before we can look at what he wrote there, let me first give you a little bit of background. The monumental change about the Church at Vatican II was that the Council claimed that the true Church of Jesus Christ subsists in the Catholic Church, whereas the traditional teaching insisted upon by Pope Pius XII had been that the true church of Jesus Christ is the Catholic Church, that they are one and the same thing, as he wrote in the encyclical Humani Generis in 1950. Now, when you go from is to subsists in, you are inevitably creating confusion, right? You're muddying the waters. Everyone understands what it means to say that the church founded by Jesus is the Catholic church. But when you change that to say that that church subsists in the Catholic church, it is no longer clear what exactly you mean. Ask 10 different people about what it means, and you'll get 11 different answers. It is true that subsistence is a very precise mode of existing. Something that subsists exists as a substance, not as an accident, for example. But that doesn't save Vatican II at all because it says that this church, Christ founded, exists in the Catholic Church, thereby drawing a distinction between two churches, the church founded by Christ and the Catholic Church. 
And although the council claims that this church has its proper existence in the Roman Catholic Church, it also claims that it exists in elements in other religious bodies. All right, now we can look at what Ratzinger wrote in 2001 in the Vatican newspaper. Quote, With this expression, and he means the subsists in, with this expression, the council differs from the formula of Pius XII, who said in his encyclical Mystici Corporis Christi, the Catholic Church is, Latin est, is the one mystical body of Christ. The difference between subsistit and est conceals within itself the whole ecumenical problem, unquote. That is from the English edition of Osservatore Romano of September 19th, 2001, page 5. So, to return to Joshua Charles, here's the problem he has. He says, very correctly, that the Catholic Church cannot change her nature. But he leaves out of account that the institution he identifies as that Catholic Church defines itself as having a different nature from the Catholic Church that was once ruled by Pope Pius XII and all his predecessors. See, this is why we're said of our contests. We believe that the Catholic Church cannot change. It is the Vatican II Church that doesn't believe that. Now, Charles draws an analogy with the people of Israel in the Old Covenant, and he points out that they often became unfaithful. Right? They wandered off into idolatry and apostasy, but they still remained the true people of God. That's his argument. And while that is true for Israel, the analogy is false because who belonged to the people of Israel was determined by kinship and not by public profession of faith. You were born into the people of Israel by being a descendant of Abraham, right? Or more properly, of Jacob. That is what made you an Israelite. But in the New Covenant, that is completely different because the church is a spiritual people. The members of the church founded by Christ are not determined by natural kinship, but by faith, that is, by the common public profession of that faith, by baptism, and by being subject to the lawful hierarchy. Remember, Christ said to Nicodemus in John 3 that a man had to be born again spiritually. And he told the Jews in John 8 that their descent from Abraham is of no value if they do not believe in him. In his letter to the Romans, St. Paul writes, Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Of the Gentiles too, assuredly, there is only one God who will justify the circumcised man if he learns to believe, and the Gentile because he believes. That's Romans 3, 29 and 30. And I'm using the Monsignor Ronald Knox translation here because the Douay Reims is a bit obscure on this. Likewise, in Galatians 3, 26 through 29, St. Paul says, Through faith in Christ Jesus, you are all now God's sons. All you who have been baptized in Christ's name have put on the person of Christ. No more Jew or Gentile, no more slave and freeman, no more male and female. You are all one person in Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are indeed Abraham's children. The promised inheritance is yours. Joshua Charles repeatedly makes the point that the church includes saints and sinners, sheep and goats, wheat and chaff, clean and unclean. And yes, that's all very true. But that is always in reference to Catholics, to the members of of the church. You have to be a Catholic to be a member of the Catholic Church. Now, that stands to reason. Yes, holy Catholics and terribly sinful Catholics both are members of the church, but heretics are not members of the church. Again, what Charles is doing is he's lumping all sins together, sins against faith and sins against morals. And Although he doesn't say it outright, the implication is 
that therefore it doesn't matter if bishops or cardinals profess the true faith or not, or if the Pope teaches heresy in his magisterium, or if he leads souls to hell with evil laws or invalid sacramental rites. None of that matters because it's still the true church. That, at least, is what I'm understanding Charles to be saying. What evidence does he give for that? Well, none that actually says that. On the contrary, we have countless examples from the papal magisterium teaching the opposite of what Charles is arguing. For example, remember what Pope Pius XII taught about membership in the church. Quote, actually, only those are to be included as members of the church who have been baptized and profess the true faith and who have not been so unfortunate as to separate themselves from the unity of the body or been excluded by legitimate authority for grave faults committed. For in one spirit, says the apostle, were we all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free. As, therefore, in the true Christian community there is only one body, one spirit, one Lord, and one baptism, so there can be only one faith. And therefore, if a man refuse to hear the church, let him be considered, so the Lord commands, as a heathen and a publican. It follows that those who are divided in faith or government cannot be living in the unity of such a body, nor can they be living the life of its one divine spirit. Unquote. That's from the encyclical Mystici Corporis, number 22. So there you have it. Whoever does not profess the faith of the Catholic Church cannot be a member of it. So now we have to ask, does Francis profess that faith? Does Robert McElroy? Does Blaise Supich? Does James Martin or Richard Rohr? Does Reinhard Marx or Georg Betzing? But more importantly, regardless of what these individual clerics do or don't profess, the bigger question is, does the official magisterium of the Vatican II Church teach Catholicism? And if it does, what is there to resist? Why should anyone resist the Catholic magisterium? But if it does not teach Catholicism, then it cannot be the Catholic magisterium, because unlike the people of Israel, God founded the spiritual Israel, the Catholic Church, as the pillar and ground of the truth, the infallible church which, as Pope Pius IX taught, quote, can never totter and fall while this chair remains intact, the chair which rests on the rock which the proud gates of hell cannot overthrow and in which there is the whole and perfect solidity of the Christian religion, unquote. And he's talking about the papal chair, of course, the Holy See, the chair of St. Peter. That's from the encyclical Inter Multipliches, number seven. Returning now to Joshua Charles, he writes, quote, Scripture makes abundantly clear there is only one body of Christ, which is the church, and there is only one church preaching only one faith, unquote. Amen. But then that's not the Vatican II Church, is it? I mean, the reason why there is traditionalism at all is precisely because the Vatican II Church does not teach or profess the Roman Catholic faith as it was known until the death of Pope Pius XII. Charles also writes, quote, This is why the Church Fathers everywhere taught the necessity of unity with the Church for salvation, and that the Catholic Church was that one true Church, unquote. Again, couldn't agree more. But that is not the teaching of the Vatican II Church, which claims that the mystical body of Christ includes all the baptized, regardless of whether they're Lutherans, Anglicans, Orthodox, Presbyterians, or whatever. Charles goes on to denounce, quote, a form of ecclesial utopianism that, in its quest for a pure church, has murdered countless souls in the same way political utopianism has murdered countless bodies, unquote. 
Well, you know, it would have been good if he could have defined what exactly he means by that pure church he says is utopian. If by that he means that the church only consists of exceptionally holy people, then of course that is utopian and is certainly not the church founded by Christ, which exists precisely to make sinners holy, and that is typically a lifelong struggle. However, if by that pure church he means a church that is the ark of salvation, that teaches only salutary doctrine, offers to God the true and perfect worship, makes holy laws and sanctifies its people by dispensing the sacraments, then not only is that not utopian, it is in fact a dogma of the faith that the church is pure and perfect in that way. In the creed, we profess belief in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. In Ephesians 5.27, St. Paul speaks of a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Sounds like a pure church to me. In the Encyclical Mystici Corporis, paragraph 66, Pope Pius XII writes, quote, Certainly the loving mother, he's talking about the church, Certainly the loving mother is spotless in the sacraments by which she gives birth to and nourishes her children. In the faith which she has always preserved inviolate, in her sacred laws imposed on all, in the evangelical counsels which she recommends, in those heavenly gifts and extraordinary graces through which, with inexhaustible fecundity, she generates hosts of martyrs, virgins, and confessors. But it cannot be laid to her charge if some members fall, weak, or wounded. Unquote. When it comes to the holiness of the Church, Catholic theology distinguishes ontological holiness from moral holiness. The Church's doctrines of faith and morals, her laws, her worship, and her sacraments all pertain to her ontological holiness, and that is a necessary property the Church cannot lose. Yes, the church can have bad popes, immoral, wicked popes, but she cannot have non-Catholic popes that impose a false religion on the faithful, corrupt the church's perfect worship, taint the Catholic magisterium, and make laws that lead souls to hell, such as permitting those in public mortal sin to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion. If those things were possible, how then would the Catholic Church be distinguished from heretical sects? What would be the point of such a church, and how could we take it seriously in its claim to being the Ark of Salvation? To sum up, there are two fundamental errors in Joshua Charles's article, The Catholic Response to Corrupt Cardinals. One, he fails to distinguish sins against faith from sins against morals. And two, he fails to distinguish the personal holiness, or lack thereof, of clergy from the official exercise of the magisterium of the church, which cannot mislead souls, cannot preach condemned doctrines, cannot teach errors against the faith. So these are two enormous blunders the author makes, which taint both his analysis and his conclusion. There is no saving the Vatican II Church if you cannot adhere to it because it teaches modernism and other heresies and errors, then it's not the pillar and ground of the truth, not the Ark of Salvation, and not the Roman Catholic Church. It is a diabolical counterfeit. Tratcast Express is a production of Novus Ordo Watch. Check us out at tratcast.org, and if you like what we're doing, please consider making a tax-deductible contribution at novusordowatch.org slash donate.